Okay, you should have tried this problem on your own, and now we will go through it together. All right, so when Mentos are dropped into a newly opened bottle of Diet Coke, carbon dioxide is released from the Diet Coke very rapidly, calling, causing it to be expelled or shoot out of the bottle. An experiment was completed to predict the amount of Diet Coke that shoots out of the bottle in cups with different numbers of Mentos is dropped in. I was going to do this experiment for you, but I figured it would take too long and you guys wouldn't like to see uh, five videos of me getting Diet Coke all over my living room. All right, so instead we'll just have to rely on the data that they collected. So looking at this, uh, before we do anything, let's identify the explanatory and response variables because we're going to reference back to them. So remember, explanatory is always my X, response is always my Y. And they need to be in numbers, right? Units, something. So my explanatory, what, uh, what I'm testing is my number of Mentos dropped in, right? That explains how much Diet Coke is expelled. So I'm going to say cups of Diet Coke expelled. All right. So here's our linear regression line. Y hat, or the predicted value of Y, is uh, 1 plus 0 0.07x, where X represents the number of Mentos dropped in, and Y represents cups of Diet Coke expelled. All right, before we do anything, I want to go ahead and just interpret the Y intercept and the slope to get you a little bit more practice, right? So my slope is 0 0.07, and my Y intercept is equal to 1.0. All right, so let's talk about what each of these mean. And again, you don't have to write this down. This is just for your own practice. All right, so my slope for every increase in Mentos, or I should say in number of Mentos dropped in, the Diet Coke expelled will increase. Oh, what did I forget? I definitely forgot to say the predicted amount of Diet Coke expelled will increase by 0 0.07 cups okay so that and you're going to use the same sentence stem you're just replacing the x and the y and the slope right so for interpreting the slope for every one unit increase in x or for every one increase in the number of mentos dropped in the predicted and we must say predicted because we're using this model to predict the predicted amount of diet coke, coke expelled will increase by 0 0.07 cups why did i say increase because our slope is positive. If it were negative, I'd say decrease, right? All right, and then our y-intercept meaning. Can x be zero? So does this make sense for it to be uh, zero Mentos dropped in and still have a cup of Diet Coke expelled? Um, I think if we have a Diet Coke that, that's just sitting on my counter, right, and I don't do anything to do it, to it, I don't put any Mentos into it, would um, one cup of it just suddenly come out of the bottle? I don't think so, right? <laughs> unless I knock it over, unless I'm shaking it up. But basically, I don't think that the y-intercept has any meaning in this context because the Diet Coke would be stationary unless something happened to it, right? So with zero Mentos dropped in, I wouldn't say that one cup will be expelled, right? Um, so you need to think about when x is zero, what does that mean for the equation or for the model? All right, so now let's move on to this packet information. We're going to interpret the, the value of s. Before we do anything, let's, let's slap a unit onto this s. So remember, my standard deviation of residuals is always the, ex the response variable unit. My response is cups of Diet Coke. So this is going to be 0 0.067 cups. All right, my interpretation. The actual cups of Diet Coke expelled is typically 
0 0.067 cups away from the cups predicted by the least squared regression line with x equals number of Mentos dropped in. All right. Nice job. So remember, our S is our typical prediction error. Oh my gosh, typical prediction error. My brain just works so fast, you know, that's why it makes errors like that. <laughs> All right, so that is our standard deviation of residuals, our S, and that's our interpretation of S. So now let's start on the second part of the second, which is interpreting our R squared. All right, so before we talk about R squared, let's just talk about regular old R. What does R equal? R is our correlation coefficient. Remember we learned about that in packet two. It's between negative one and one, and it indicates how strongly associated our two variables are, right? We can describe it talking about whether or not it's positive or negative, and whether or not it's moderate, weak, strong. So that's our R. Our R squared is essentially our R squared. And it's called the coefficient of determination. So basically what the coefficient of determination is, is it measures the percent of variability in the response variable that is accounted for by our model. It's basically saying like, okay, our model can predict something, right? But it, it can only predict how our, our explanatory variable expects, uh, or how our explanatory variable affects our response variable. And there could be other variables associated with the response variable, right? So let me make a note that R squared has no units. It's a percent. It's a percent. So what we would say, our interpretation sentence stem, is about R squared, whatever that is, about blank percent of the variability in the number of Y context is accounted for by the least squared regression line with X equals our explanatory variable. All right, before we jump into the example, let's just kind of talk about this. So if I wanted to create a model to predict my response variable y is going to be my dog Spencer's activity level. And we're going to say that activity level is on a scale of 0 to 10. You'd think it'd be on a scale of 1 to 10, but Would anyone describe this as a one? He's literally not moving anything at all. That's gotta be a zero. Spencer, oh, that's a one. See it? He opened his eyes. <laughs> so if I wanted to create a model to predict Spencer's activity level, I would think of some sort of explanatory variable, right? And I would use that explanatory variable to predict his activity level. Well, the first thing I can think of is his weight in pounds. Spencer weighs a hefty 65 pounds. He's definitely overweight for his size. So if he has a higher weight, his activity level would go down, right? So the higher, the more, the increase in weight, the lower the activity level. That should be a negative correlation, right? A negative association. Um, so I create a model. I do some tests. I create a model to predict his activity level. Well, as his weight goes up and down, I start getting these residuals. So his activity level that I predicted um, doesn't, from my model, doesn't match his actual activity level. Well, it's probably got something to do with other variables, right? What other variables could, ex um, could, could affect Spencer's activity level? 
Well, the temperature outside, right? Spencer doesn't like to do anything when it's really hot outside. Um, what else? The amount of his exercise per day, right? If he's exercising per day, running around, chasing my cat, then he's probably um, feeling good, has more of a healthy level, and he would be at more active, right? His amount of fluff. When Spencer's really fluffy, he gets hot easily. He drinks a lot of water, but that's about it. So his level of fluff would definitely affect his activity level. So all of these things are affecting his activity level, and I have only based a model off of weight, right? So I could say that weight maybe has um, accounts for 50% of the variability accounted for by the least squared re regression line, right? 50% of how Spencer's activity level is predicted is affected by weight. The other 50% is the other things that we talked about. All right, so let's get to an example. All right, below is a scatter plot of people's height, the explanatory variable, and weight, the response variable. So basically it's saying how tall you are affects how much you weigh, right? There is some relationship. And from the scatter plot, we can tell that the relationship is positive, right? The line is going up from left to right. All right, our R squared is 15%. So let's interpret that R squared, and we can use the sentence stem from above. We would say about 15% of the variability in people's weight is accounted for. by the least squared regression line with x equals height. And we'll say height in inches, even though the problem didn't tell us, but we want to include a unit. All right, about only 15% of the variability, right? Percents go up to 100%. So there's some other variables that are affecting people's weight, right? So if 15% is accounted for by height with our prediction model, what percent is due to other variables that are not accounted for in my model? Let's see. All we have to do is 100% minus 15% would give me 85%. So 85% of the variability between um, people's weight is not accounted for by their height. So what are some other variables? Um, diet, exercise, Stress level, income level, all these things could affect people's weight, right? Age. So their height is not the only thing. Only 15% of the movement in weight is accounted for by height. All right, before we go on to the next example, I want to talk about the relationship between R squared and R. So if I'm given R squared, you can certainly find R, right? So if R squared is 15%, all I need to do to find R is take the square root of 15%, right? Okay, so let me just do that. Square root of 15. Uh, so my R is 3.87. No, it does not. And that's because R can only be between negative 1 and 1, right? So whenever I'm trying to find R, I have to change this percentage into a decimal, which would be 0.15. So my R would equal the square root of 0.15. So my R, and let's just round it to two decimals. So this 7 would bump the 8 up to 9. So my R is 0 0.39. So I would call that positive and weak. Okay, wait a minute. I can say it's positive because R is positive, but if I take the square root of anything, I'm never going to get a negative number. So how do I know that this, I mean, how would this ever be negative, right? So when I'm taking the square root, it will never be negative. So what I need to do is look to the slope. If my slope is positive, my R is going to be positive, right? If my slope is negative, then I have a negative so association and my R would be negative. So after you take the square root, you need to do the extra step of checking to see if that slope is positive or negative. 
All right, and I'll see you in video three.